Hello and welcome to Enchantment of Eternity's review for Stormfront, which are episodes 1 and 2 of season 4 of Star Trek Enterprise. This video is part of a series of videos where I uh, review episodes of Star Trek as determined by my user polls. Uh, this episode, uh, to win my latest uh, uh, Star Trek Enterprise user poll, which came out like two or three months ago, sorry I'm just getting around to it now, is uh, Stormfront, the two-parter. So Stormfront's the episode where Enterprise finds itself in an alternate past during World War II where Nazis have invaded uh, the U.S. and uh, Archer finds himself in New York City where he teams up with the band of local resistance fighters to take on the these aliens who are trying to uh, start the temporal cold war and he has a, an objective to stop them even ends up teaming up with Silic and reuniting with his enterprise crew in order to stop the evil aliens of Losk uh, and prevent the temporal cold war forever happening and restore the timeline so, um, as you know, this episode is, uh, was, there was a cliffhanger at the end of season three finale that seemed to come out of nowhere because season three is all about the Zindi story arc and wrapping it up when we had this, uh, really intense episode, Zero Hour, where, you know, Archer put his life on the line to defeat the Zindi and stop the weapon from destroying Earth just in the nick of time. And all of a sudden, at the end of that episode, he wakes up and he finds himself uh, during World War II, surrounded by a bunch of Nazis in alien and Nazi uniforms. So, <laughs> what's the deal with that? A lot of people had issues with that cliffhanger. They seemed to come out of nowhere. Um, I have been vocal that my, myself in the past actually watched the uh, these episodes out of order. So I actually saw the two-parter, at least the second part <laughs> of the two-parter. Before I saw the cliffhanger, so I kind of knew it was coming, so I wasn't too shocked about it. and So I didn't have that experience of being like, what the hell is this shit? But, um, as I talked about before, so that cliffhanger was the idea of then showrunners, um, Brennan Brega and Rick Berman, who, as you know, I had a lot of issues with. Um, um, but, uh, they sort of bowed out in the season four and Manny Cotto took over. So these episodes, uh, mark the first episodes where Manny Cotto was the full on showrunner. Now Manny Cotto joined the writing staff in season three and was an important voice in season three, which is why I feel season three improved greatly from the first two seasons, and and then he took over full on as showrunner in season four. So I always describe this as Manny Cotto yes anding. Uh, Brennan Brega, because Brennan Brega is obsessed with the 40s and 50s, particularly when it comes to this show for some reason. He kept trying to give it a 40s and 50s feel, which is why I personally didn't care for it. Um, and so and he's obsessed with World War II. And because he was also heavily involved in the Voyager 2 parter, the Killing Game, which is two parter, reminds me a lot of. Of. Now, if you don't recall the Killing Game, the Killing Game was a two-parter in Voyager where the Herogen took over the ship and they decided to run all these holodeck simulations like they were obsessed with battling on the holodeck to have simulated hunts or simulated fighting. And for some reason, they spent the whole time in the World War II simulation where they um, took on you know, the Herogen aliens, they took on Nazi uniforms and joined up with the Nazi and the Voyager crew played the role of the resistance fighters. So I'm sure you can see the similarities here because here we also have aliens and Nazi uniforms teaming up and then uh, our heroes, the main characters, team up with resistance fighters uh, to take on uh, <laughs> the evil aliens, the evil Nazi aliens, which is, I mean, you always have metaphors like the New Order in uh, Force Awakens, a pretty obvious metaphor for uh, space Nazis, and it's a very common theme throughout science fiction, but um, here, these two episodes, or this two-parter and the other two-parter, Killing Game, um, are, don't even have it a metaphor, they're just blatant in your face. 
hey, these are space Nazis, which is kind of like eye-rolling to me. And as I said, Brennan Brega seems to be, he. I could go on about how all these 40s, 50s, 60s themed episodes he did in the later years of Voyager and Enterprise, which I, I hate. Honestly, I, I, I don't like it. Um, so it seemed like, because this was the idea, but uh, as I said, Manny Cotto took over as showrunner for these episodes, so it seems like he yes and it. And so he's like, okay, we'll have space Nazis in the 40s, but we're going to make this alter in history. We're going to tie it into the Temple Cold War. That will make sense why the Enterprise is there. And the feel he gave it didn't feel, didn't have that bland 40s feel that Braga likes to do. So it actually elevated, uh, in my opinion, uh, this episode or this two parter. And so they took that crappy cliffhanger that everyone was pissed off about. And did something good with it. Now, does that mean these episodes are amazing? Well, not quite amazing. As I said, it's still held back. Like Enterprise itself. is Even when it's good, it's held a bit back by its premise. So, um, but what's interesting is because we still have... It's very much like The Killing Game. It reminds me so too much like The Killing Game, as I already said. And also, uh, the the character that Archer meets, um, blanking on her name, um, but the character he teams up with, uh, a woman from the past, uh, an African-American woman from the past, uh, it reminds me too much of what they did in First Contact with Lily, where Picard teamed up with an African-American woman from the past, and, uh, and at first they didn't get along, and then uh, he, you know, took her to her ship and be like, oh, look, here's, we're in space, and they're like wild by it, and then they became close allies. They pretty much repeated that story beat here, but less interesting. I think this character is less developed than Lily was in First Contact, which is surprising because that film is kind of infamous for its under character development, not, but, um, yeah. I think so in many in some ways this two parter does come off as a pale shadow of other episodes that come before it. But I think there's enough originality there to keep it going because instead of just being in the forties or being in a holodeck simulation, this is an alternate history and that aspect of it does add a lot of interest to it. Now they the Temple Cold War was a storyline introduced in the pilot episode. It was kind of forced when the writers buy the studio. And it's something that I actually... A lot of people have mixed feelings about. There's a lot of people who are very much against the whole idea of the Temporal Cold War. Um, I thought it was the only interesting through storyline in the first season, personally. Just me. Even though it wasn't always great. Uh, I think it was better than, than them going camping or making snowman or whatever bullshit other things they're doing in the first season. But anyway... Uh, <laughs> um... It was kind of a divisive thing, and uh, so that they focused on that in the first season, a little bit in the second season, but third season completely ignored it because they were off doing the Zindi story arc. Now, the Temple Cold War didn't introduce the character of Daniels, a reoccurring character who did appear in the third season because third season also had to do with time manipulation, aliens from the future trying to manipulate the timeline, but it didn't involve the Temple Cold War, but it did involve time manipulation, so you still had Daniels you know, the temporal agent from the 29th century uh, who tries to uh, prevent any changes in the timeline. And so this episode worked to kind of wrap up that storyline. Now, there's mixed feelings about this. A lot of people, and myself included, I would agree with this, think that they kind of rushed the ending. And particularly, it doesn't live up to... The, how the Temporal Cold War was established in the first two seasons. Particularly, we never got an answer to who the fuck Super Future Guy is, or Mystery Man, or whatever you call him, that shadowy figure dude that Silic takes his orders from. That's They never answered that, which kind of annoys me. Although, I heard that Brennan Brega's idea for who Mystery Man is is that it would be a future version of Archer. And, and if that's the case, I'd rather they not answer than have future Archer. That's so dumb. <laughs> I'm sorry, but it is. And, um, so, yeah, I mean, so, but it's clear that Brendan Berg and Rick Berman, when they first wrote and created Mystery Man or Future Guy, they had no idea who he was. They are just, yeah, it looks cool. Let's just throw him in there, which is, I think that's lazy writing. 
personally. <laughs> Just me. But anyway, um, so it didn't answer who that guy was. Um, but at, I think at least they did address the Dumble Cold War and wrap it up. And they took the time to wrap it up rather than just sweeping it under the rug and pretending it didn't exist. I think that would have been a worst case scenario. I think at least they took the time to have, bring Silic back and have him die and give finality, finality to it and say, oh, the Temple Cold War turned into hot war and the biggest uh, advocate, adversary of the Temple Cold War is this alien dude named Vlosk and we have to stop him. Uh, but we'd never seen Vlosk or his species before, and he, he did so. It just seems very jarring to come out of nowhere, like, ooh, here's the new bad guys, and ah, after the two parter, they're defeated. Don't worry about them anymore. <laughs> so that part did seem a bit rushed to me. But as I said, I do like the sense of finality to it. I do like that they acknowledge the Temple Cold War storyline, and I do like seeing Silic again and having Archer have to work with him in order to take on the greater foe. And I love the conversations we get between Archer and Silic and the complexity uh, of their relationship and how it's never a straight out like adversarial like he'll team up with them from time to time if it suits his purposes. Now when Silic dies at the end of the episode, he says to Archer, uh, you've been such a worthy opponent, I wish I could have died fighting you. Um, but when he said, I wish you've been, you, I, when he said, you've been such a worthy opponent, I was thinking to myself, has he been though? I mean, is he really a worthy opponent? I don't know. I don't think so. <laughs> because throughout the first two seasons, Archer basically gets his ass kicked every time. I mean, there was that one time in the shockwave where, where Archer, like, comes back and, like, kicks Silic's ass and says, I say you're an ugly bastard, but that's about it. Usually, Silic gets the better of Archer, and uh, most of the time, Silic acts like he has all the information and Archer's an idiot, a naive baby, doesn't know anything. Oh, you stupid baby. This is above your head. You don't understand what's going on. That's always been Silic's attitude. Was even his attitude in this episode. So, is that really a worthy opponent? I don't know. Doesn't seem so to me. <laughs> and plus, as I said, the relationship has always been complex. Sometimes they're on the same side, sometimes not. So is that really his, like, his arch enemy? Or archer enemy? Ha <laughs> ha Sorry. Sorry, <laughs> I had to do it. I don't think so. I, I, I don't know. I, that line seemed a bit out of just there for it to say, look, this character, this villain that was the main villain for the first two seasons, he's out of here, so he's saying goodbye. I mean, that's fine, I guess. Uh, so anyway, um, yeah, so the World War II stuff, like being in New York and singing under seats, is, is, was kind of interesting, but a lot of these characters that Archer meets, like, uh, yeah, I can't even remember her name, and the, um, the, the two, like, uh, what should I call it? What are they called? Loan sharks, you have the two loan sharks who are like your stereotypical New York loan sharks with the New York accents. Hey, I'm walking here. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, what was it? Sal and Carmine. Um, those are all throwaway characters. Like, I didn't really care. It's like when Archer came back to New York and with Silic and he teamed up with Carmine again and they're like and they introduce him like oh my god there they are again like I don't care about these characters like the episode is like oh look there they are back to save the day and like in a lot of the fighting I thought was very generic now there's one other scene I really want to talk about is that at the start of the episode where Archer is first uh, captured by the Nazis, and they had this Nazi talking to him, saying, Oh, you Americans with your Hollywood and your Betty Grable. First of all, that seems a trope that so many... I think they did this in The Killing Game do too, and I think they might have did this in Glorious Bastards. And they seem to do this in a lot of World War II shows and movies, where Nazis will go up to American soldiers and talk about Hollywood, and talk about Betty Grable, and whatnot, and 
I don't think that's. I don't think Nazis were really that obsessed with Betty Grable in Hollywood. <laughs> I mean, sure, maybe that's all they know of Americans because that's all. The, that's their signature is Hollywood or whatnot. But I really don't think they really talked about Hollywood all the time with the with the American soldiers they captured. Just me. That just seems like a cliche to see all the freaking time. And the second thing I want to say about this scene is the actor who's playing that Nazi is the same exact actor they had playing the Nazi in the killing game. Again, talking about the killing game. Now, in the killing game, that Nazi was the main character. I was all kind of expecting, even now, from memory, uh, that this character would be a main character in this two-part, but actually this is the only scene he's in. But it's basically the exact same fucking character <laughs> from The Killing Game. It's the same actor. He's acting exactly the same. He's playing a Nazi. Um, I don't know. <laughs> it seems a bit too on the nose and uh, unoriginal to me is all I'm saying. Uh, so, yeah. So, then you get uh, other storylines like Trip uh, going down the planet and being impersonated by Silic, which is... That was all... All real good stuff. And I like how, like, when Trip was reunited with the actual Archer, he thought it was Silic because Silic can shape shift, and he was just like uh, almost shot him. Like <laughs> that. That was good stuff. But um, so there was a lot of good things in this episode. Like the true storyline was interesting enough. Um, like I did like, yeah, how Daniel showed up on the Enterprise, like dying because he's all time warped and everything. And that was a good way to sort of raise the stakes because Daniel's always been your protector and he can save it. And it has made it very clear that he's not going to help. He's not going to save the day. And he's actually dependent on Archer and Enterprise to save the day for him, which did, uh, set up a very interesting high stakes, uh, storyline where it was a sort of battle of wits between Archer and Vlosk and Archer eventually gets the better of them and saves the day and wins. Hooray! <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so it was a very, it was a very good episode, but, uh, nothing spectacular, like, uh, yeah. So anyway, my rating for, um, Stormfront out of 10 is a 7, very good. Uh, decent episode, uh, wraps up the Temple Cold War storyline, maybe a bit too quickly, <laughs> so it's not amazing, and some of these characters are very underdeveloped, uh, so it's not like a, a really great episode or anything, but, you know, it's interesting, it's good enough, it's definitely higher quality than the first two seasons, that's for sure. Anyway, <laughs> that is it for my review of uh, Stormfront, and I'm actually, since I'm going to be really busy on my channel for the next several months, I'm actually going to put a pause on my Star Trek episode reviews for several months, uh, and then hopefully in March or April I'll be able to get back to them and start doing more polls where you can vote on them and uh, review more episodes, but uh, we've got Picard coming out soon, I'm still doing with my uh, Expanse reviews and stuff like that, so that's going to, and Mr. Robot's finishing up, so that's going to take up all my time for the next several months, but uh, in the meantime, you know, Star Trek fans, you can check out my Picard reviews, and I'm going to be doing my uh, monthly season-by-season -season reviews of Next Generation, hopefully starting in January as well. So you can check that out, and hopefully I'll be back by March for my to resume my Star Trek episode reviews. Anyway, thanks guys so much for watching. Be sure to check out my channel as I cover many other shows uh, and many other Star Trek shows and also other shows like uh, Mr. Robot, The Expanse, and more. So be sure to subscribe so you can keep up with all of that. And thanks a lot for watching.